Okay, so before I begin, I have a logistics question for those, the powers that be. I'm actually going to be reading a couple of sections from my book, and so I actually need a light down here. So I'm not sure where the light is, or up above me. So that, anyway, so logistics. Sorry, we didn't, we didn't, I didn't realize they were turning the lights down. So, I apologize. Okay. Okay, I will start, and uh, at some point a light will appear. <laughs> I believe. It's coming, okay. Okay, no worries. There's no speakers. Oh, there's a light. I wonder what that was. Is that enough? That should work. Yeah, okay. And I'm going to put my water here so hopefully it doesn't spill all over. <laughs> a lot of electronics going on here. Um, sorry. Okay, so I can't see anybody, but I would like to thank everybody that's coming, <laughs> that came to, out in this cold, dark evening um, to come and listen to me. And I'd also like to thank Mary Murphy. Um, <laughs> who invited me here, and um, the Center for uh, Western Lands and Peoples. I just want to say that um, when Mary heard that my book was coming out this year, she was the very first person and first school, thank you MSU, um, to invite me to come and talk um, about my work. And the second institution that invited me to talk, and I'm going to be there next week, um, was Harvard University. So. <laughs> At MSU, once again, ahead of the curve. <laughs> and just to let you know, um, UM has not invited me yet. <laughs> but I'm representing with my big UM earrings. Um, so I want to begin in an, in an odd way. Um, I'm actually going to read for, to you from a review um, that Ted Binema wrote, part of a review. And for those of you who are grad students out there, which I met a few grad students and, and undergraduate students earlier today, um, this is a great um, uh, example of kind of a book review, even though the whole review is like three pages long. And then I'm going to read you a review from a girlfriend. So, okay, really quickly. This is a multifaceted book. I love that. Because I could never figure out how to describe this book to people. So multifaceted is, is perfect. Um, in presenting and defending her central argument, Lapeer sheds considerable light upon Blackfeet history and upon, and upon those outsiders who sought and recorded Blackfeet stories during that period. The evidence upon which the argument is based is derived from stories, knowledge, and history that the author heard and acquired from her own family, elders, and other knowledgeable members of the Blackfeet community, and from extensive research in no fewer than 11 archives. I'm skipping over that. While the author is herself rooted in Blackfeet society, the presentation is scholarly, unromantic, and remarkably dispassionate <laughs> without losing its insider perspective. Lapeer playfully punctuates the academic prose with dry and ironic humor. Okay, that's what an academic says. This is what your girlfriend says. In other words, <laughs> she's got street cred, academic chops, and is funny as hell. <laughs> So, I don't normally do that. <laughs> I thought, I thought hers, hers was pretty funny. Okay, so I usually introduce myself by introducing my family um, and, and uh, who I come from. So on my mother's side of the family, uh, my grandfather was known as Ayuka My Ames Back. He was also known as Francis Wall. Um, he was a member of the Skunks Band, and he grew up on Blacktail Creek um, on the south side of the Blackfeet Reservation. And my grandmother was Annie Madplume. She was a member of the Never Laughs Band, or They Don't Laugh um, Band, and she grew up on uh, Little Badger Creek. Um, on the Métis side of my family, uh, my grandfather um, was um, Arthur Baptiste Lapierre, and he grew up on the Dearborn River, which is outside of Augusta, Montana. And my grandmother was Louise Laframboise, who grew up on Frenchman's Creek, which is outside of Seiko, which is outside of Malta, for those of you who don't know Montana. 
Um, so anyway, so that's um, my family and who I come from. And I usually introduce myself that way because in Montana, as people always say about Montana, it's a small town, right? Um, with really long roads. <laughs> so, okay. So I wanted to briefly introduce myself um, by mentioning a lot of the community activism I do. So one of the things that I think of myself as is a writer, which I'll talk about in a minute, but I also am involved in lots of community activism. Um, that really is one of the things that um, really uh, keeps me grounded um, in, in the uh, world that I live in, and um, it makes me um, both angry and happy at the same time. So, <laughs> um, so one of the things I've been doing for a very long time is native language revitalization work, um, and this is a picture of a group of um, really the, you know, the language warriors out there in the United States, and I won't introduce who they are. Um, this is a group of folks um, from the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation, including Taya Miles and um, Joe Gaughan, who have been here, well, I guess they kind of live here, right, um, technically now, um, from a project they worked on with um, the Red Thunder Oral History Project. Um, so I was part of that. That was um, really um, fascinating. Um, I do lots of talks about um, ethnobotany, especially on the Blackfeet Reservation. And I work a lot with a, a drug treatment center up there called Crystal Creek Lodge, where I give um, a lot of different um, talks um, related to health and healing. Um, I also have been working the last couple of years on a food sovereignty project on the Blackfeet Reservation, trying to record um, elders' voices related to traditional food use. And um, for those of you who are interested, we're going to be holding a food summit on um, December 28th on the Blackfeet Reservation. And I'm sorry for the date, but we had to kind of do it in the middle of the break. Um, I'm also interested in politics, and so I always uh, volunteer and help out with different folks. This was uh, Patrick Weaselhead running for our city council in Missoula. Unfortunately, he lost, um, but it was a lot of fun working with him. And then this past year, um, because I had a year off, I, was, I spent this past year um, as a visiting fellow at the Harvard Divinity School, um, and I was able to, um, one, write, uh, work on my next project, but also had some extra time to really volunteer, and I volunteered to be on the National Steering Committee um, for the March for Science, and I'm still on the national board um, for the March for Science as it's transitioning, thank you. <laughs> as it's transitioning into a nonprofit organization. And so I'm actually standing behind the F. I'm sure you can see me <laughs> in there. <laughs> so uh, me and my youngest daughter uh, flew out to the March for Science. It wasn't far for us, we were in Boston. Um, so that was a really interesting and still uh, remains an interesting um, project to be a part of. Okay, so much, so much for that. Okay. Writing, I think of myself as a writer, primarily. And I have been writing for a very long time. Um, I have been writing uh, since I was in my early 20s, and I started by writing reports. When I first graduated with my degree in, with, uh, in physics, I went to work for a small, uh, well, not a small, but a nonprofit called CERT, which was the Council of Energy Resource Tribes, and I wrote a lot of reports for them. And I evolved from that, from writing reports, to writing research grants, um, to writing more reports, to finally um, deciding to go back to school, get a PhD, and write my own stuff um, that I could publish, um, instead of kind of being this anonymous report writer. Um, so anyway, so in the last couple of years, um, I published with my partner a book called City Indian uh, Native American Activism in Chicago from 1893 to 1934, and um, I'm just really interested in activism, as you can see from all of the things that I do. I mean, I'm interested in other people who are activists, so um, I'm interested especially in Native American activists in urban environments, and I'll could probably continue to write on that um, as a subject. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is um, my second book, um, which is on um, understanding the natural world um, as the Blackfeet see it, and I really do think it is unique and distinct. Um, and so that was something that I was um, focusing on in this piece. Um, this past year, I started working on my third book project, um, which is also related to the natural world and how the Blackfeet view their, um, th their relationship with the natural world, but I was really interested in this concept of purity and purification, um, what we now call kind of smudging, right? Um, but uh, 
what the Blackfeet view as um, their method of purifying themselves before they participate in religious practice. So that is um, underway. And then, ah, I knew I was going to go back. Oh, now I'm going. Let me see. Where am I? Okay, ah, okay there we go. And then I've also written a ton of other stuff. Um, so if you ever want to Google me, uh, you'll, find, you've, you'll find all kinds of things I've written. So, I mean, I think of myself, again, as a writer. And one of the things I wanted to start um, talking about tonight is um, to what extent does someone like myself write from kind of the objective historian's voice or to what extent do I write or people like myself write from an indigenous voice? And this is something that um, in the academy people are talking about and writing about. Um, I, just to let you know, um, if you read any of my work, um, I avoid using a lot of the phraseology that we find in, in the academy today, so you're not going to see me s say the word epistemology, right? <laughs> I'm going to say it in a more, in a more general way. Um, so viewing things, I think, through an indigenous lens. Um, so I think what makes... Um, my writing different than what you would see from a typical um, historian um, is that I really ground my writing in three things. Um, one is um, family stories, and these are family stories that I've learned um, from elders in my own family and from me just talking to people in my own family. Um, community stories and community history that I've learned from other elders um, in the community. And then also, um, also learned from elders are stories about places. And I think one of the things that's different about um, Native American views of the natural world and Native American views of history is that we think of places as um, both uh, individual places on the landscape, but those places contain stories, they contain songs, they contain history. And so when the Blackfeet um, historically would look out kind of onto the landscape, which I can't see right now, um, look out onto the landscape, uh, they would see the history of their people because they would look, see one place and another place and another place and another place, and all of these places had stories. And layered on top of that, besides their history, was also a sacred text um, where these specific places also had a connection to the supernatural realm. And those places also had a different type of story. So when they would look out onto the landscape, their landscape really was what we would consider like a, new, a mnemonic device, um, where they would memorize the landscape where they lived and the landscape that they traveled. And because they memorized that, they would have all of those stories um, that would uh, be able to not only have them remember their own history, but be able to share their history with other people. So I think of those three as something that is um, uh, not necessarily unique um, to, to Native um, uh, people, but something that when Native people are looking at writing history from an indigenous lens, that you really should consider all three of those things together. And this is a phrase from um, Bill Farr, who's a professor at the University of Montana. He liked to use the word kind of value added, right? Um, what makes certain historians different is value added of, you know, are they really from that community? Are they connected? Um, do they have access to people who have knowledge? Um, do they have access to um, elders? Elders don't always have knowledge. <laughs> and there can be young people who have knowledge as well. But do they have access to people with knowledge? That's not always the case. Um, I know a lot of um, indigenous historians who do not have connection um, to their own home communities or they don't have access to knowledgeable people. So when they are writing about um, writing indigenous history, they sometimes do not have that quote unquote value added. Um, added to that, of course, is the Western um, methodology, um, which I am a huge fan of. So um, don't ever uh, mistake my thinking about indigenous kind of writing, um, because I do think that there is a lot of value um, that you can find in Western um, historical methods, and that is looking at archival sources and primary sources. Of course, you always have to look at those um, and recognize that they are written um, uh, in a colonizing space or a colonized space, and so you always have to you know, look at them and, and be critical. 
Um, added to that, um, you have to recognize when you're looking at any kind of indigenous community in the US, Canada, or uh, Mexico, well, pretty much any, the whole Western Hemisphere, um, there's the history of colonization um, that you cannot escape. That is always part of the story, that always will be part of the story. But added to that is also the history of self-determination. You know, to what extent are Native people um, positioning themselves and have agency um, and really do um, uh, have uh, their own, um, you know, have their own sense of their own destiny. And this is something that in my work I always try to um, make, make sure I speak about those two things. Um, however, what I think really is different and unique about um, indigenous history, the way that I write it, um, and I think the way other people should be writing it, is that Native people always view the world through a religious lens, always. And when you look at almost any um, indigenous society or indigenous community, religion comes first. And so um, this is the motivating factor in all of their decision making. Um, this is the motivating factor in above politics, above economics. And so it's really hard to look at um, what is going on in indigenous communities without addressing religion first. And one of the things I have found when looking at some indigenous history, especially indigenous history not written um, by indigenous people or indigenous history written by indigenous people who are not, um, uh, don't have access to knowledgeable people, is they're always going to sometimes, I shouldn't say always, they sometimes see it differently. They'll think that politics comes first, they'll think that economics comes first. I will argue religion almost always comes first in terms of um, how uh, people are motivated. So I think those are the things that are kind of different. Okay, I'm doing it again. These buttons are too small. Okay, so let's see if I can do this in the dark here. So I wanted to begin by reading um, a couple of short pieces uh, from the beginning of my book here. And just to let you know, I'm going to read a little bit from the beginning and a little bit from the end. And if you want to know the rest, you ain't got to read the book yourself. So, okay, let me see if I can. If I don't make eye contact at this point, um, it's because I'm looking down at, into, the, into the depths of the dark here. Okay. So, my, my grandmother loved to sit and visit with people. One day, when I was an adult, my grandmother told me a story about Spotted Bear, her maternal great-grandfather. It was a story I had heard many, many, many times before. I stress this point to show that I can be a slow learner. Spotted Bear was a great warrior, one of the greatest, she would always emphasize. Her favorite stories of Spotted Bear were his adventures raiding the crow. He always seemed to get into a predicament, and then, of course, he was able to get out of it. In, these particular, in this particular story about Spotted Bear versus the Crow, my grandmother mentioned, almost as an afterthought, that Spotted Bear used his own personal medicine power and changed the direction of the wind. Whoa, wait one minute, I thought. He changed the direction of the wind? How did he do that? It was at that moment that I realized that my grandmother and Spotted Bear's relationship to the natural world and their concept of reality was dramatically different from the one that the recorders of, of, the, of Blackfeet life often wrote about in their books. So one of the things I go on to talk about is um, this difference between the way the Blackfeet see, see the natural world and the way it's written about or originally written about um, by the early um, historians. So the Blackfeet are one of the most studied and photographed tribal groups in the United States and Canada. This is probably because they appear to represent the iconic horse riding, war, bon war bonnet wearing Plains Indian. The historian Hugh Dempsey even published a bibliography containing thousands of entries on sources regarding the Blackfeet Confederacy. Many of these histories reflect um, John Ewers, who's an ethnographer, Ewers' sentiments that the Blackfeet were, quote, a hardy nomadic, nomadic hunting group who, quote, enjoyed few luxuries and who wrested a living from the resources of their own country. All my life, I had heard different kinds of stories from my, from my grandparents of how the Blackfeet altered nature, from stopping the wind from blowing, to controlling animal behavior, to creating a snowstorm so powerful it could freeze a person in mid-step. 
Historians like Ewers often told of how the natural world shaped Blackfeet behavior, suggesting that the migration of the bison led the Blackfeet to follow the herds. However, my grandparents told stories of how the Blackfeet shaped the natural world. They made the bison come to them. As I thought about my grandparents' stories, I began to recognize common threads that I had not truly noticed before, that the Blackfeet believed that they could change and control the natural world. And this belief gave them a certain level of confidence and authority. It occurred to me that although I had read a lot of books and articles on Blackfeet history, my grandmother's version was not present or even emphasized in these histories. The Blackfeet had a different view of reality. So um, this is my central um, theme or thesis um, in, in what I wrote. So I start this particular um, uh, piece by uh, looking at the year 1910. So one of the things I'm interested in, if you hadn't noticed already, I'm interested in the progressive era, right? Um, I'm interested in this time period of the last um, turn of the century and what's going on there. Um, and so I started this book by looking at the time period before my grandparents were born. So my grandfather was born in 1911 and my grandmother was born in 1914. And I really wanted to understand the world that they lived in. So I decided to start my story in 1910. And so I tried to figure out what's going on in 1910, what's going on on the reservation, what's going on you know, politically, economically, socially, um, but also religiously. And so um, I have the beginning of this particular piece by looking at that time period and um, trying to get a sense of and understanding um, what is going on. So I'm just going to read a teeny, uh, a couple of uh, paragraphs from um, what is going on in 19, 1910. And um, part of this is a story of um, a Jesuit priest um, named Father Carroll. By 1910, an entire generation of Blackfeet had been born, raised, and lived into adulthood on the reservation. It had been more than 25 years since any of the old men had gone bison hunting or since any of the old women had made objects from fresh bison hides. In the 1910 issue of the Indian Sentinel, an annual periodical of the Bureau of Catholic Indian Missions, was an article by Father Carroll titled, the 4th of July dishonored, which was a scathing attack on the religious persistence of the Blackfeet people. In his article, Father Carroll described how the Blackfeet had co-opted the 4th of July and incorporated within this patriotic celebration of quote unquote national greatness, the darkest days of heathenism and bloodshed. Carroll fervently wrote that the Blackfeet had been using the 4th of July festivities as a way to also celebrate their outlawed annual Ocon or Medicine Lodge ceremony, or as people call it today, the Sundance. So Carol viewed the Ocon as more than a tourist attraction. So there was also a kind of another masking that was going on there where it was kind of a tourist, um, there was kind of tourist dancing going on, masked behind as part of Fourth of July, and masked behind that is um, this dance, this other dance going on. Carol viewed the Ocon as more than a tourist attraction. He saw its pernicious, pernicious potential. He complained that the federal government did not stop the Blackfeet from, quote, publicly parading their devilish idolatry and superstition for the admiration and amusement of a large audience of white people, unquote. Looking back from the 21st century, one may view Carol's commentary as ethnocentric or even racist but his observations of Blackfeet life were essentially correct. Despite 25 years of reservation life and US government control the Blackfeet, um, at, of Blackfeet affairs, church and government authorities were only beginning to change the inner life of the Blackfeet. Sorry, it's dark, in, dark under here. Um, I'm going to jump to the end here in a bit. So one of the things I wanted to talk about today was 
you know, what is going on um, on the reservation during this time period, so um, from 1910 on. And this, I'm just really quickly going to talk through this, but I, this is kind of stuff probably most of you in the audience already know. So in 1855 was really the first treaty that the Blackfeet um, tribe signed with the United States government. And in that treaty was the first mentioning of agriculture, um, education of children, and this idea of Christianizing and civilizing um, the Blackfeet. And so there was, um, the federal government, um, one of the things you should recognize when um, treaties were signed and money was exchanged, that most often the money that was um, provided from the U.S. government to the Blackfeet in exchange for whatever, whatever, if it was an exchange of peace, if it was an exchange of land, went into, uh, this is what the Eloise Cobell <laughs> suit is about, <laughs> goes into a pot um, that the U.S. government controls. So one of the things that the U.S. government did with that money um, that is Blackfeet money, is they spent it on um, these civilizing efforts. So when people talk about, um, you know, this changeover um, of assimilation, acculturation, um, the effort to change the Blackfeet into farmers, agriculture, um, or, or um, ranching, that was all paid for with Blackfeet money. Um, that was not paid for by the federal government. Um, that's kind of a misnomer of, of American history. So um, the U.S. government, using Blackfeet monies, um, spent a, an awful lot of time during this time period, basically from about 1855 on, um, with various um, efforts to change the Blackfeet into farmers, and it really did not work, primarily because the bison um, were still alive. Um, it wasn't until the 1880s when the bison um, ceased um, to exist, for the most part, um, and, the, and the Blackfeet primarily moved on to the reservation that it, as it exists today, that then there were stronger efforts at um, uh, trying to change the Blackfeet into farmers and ranchers. However, it really was not until this time period that I'm talking about um, that there was uh, a real um, effort that was what you would consider kind of semi um, maybe successful, and that was after allotment. So even though allotment, the actual allotment act happened um, in the late 19th century, it didn't actually happen on the Blackfeet reservation until between 1907 and 1912. Um, previous to that, there was a huge, um, you know, since they did a census to try and count everybody, et cetera. And then during those five years, they actually divided up the land and allotted land to people. After land had been allotted to individual families, then that's when there was a, a much greater effort to turn the Blackfeet into farmers and ranchers. So that's kind of the background history there. So the first effort that occurred um, was by teaching um, children to become farmers. So this is a picture from Holy Family Mission. So Holy Family Mission was a Catholic Indian mission that existed on the Blackfeet Reservation from 1890 to 1940, so for 50 years. And really, um, uh, Holy Family Mission and the other, um, uh, the other schools that existed on the Blackfeet Reservation, um, including the what became the Cutbank Boarding School. It started out as Willow Creek Boarding School. One of their main missions was to change Blackfeet children into American um, farmers and to American housewives. And so the majority of the time that they spent um, at school was not actually doing schoolwork. It wasn't doing reading and writing and arithmetic. It was actually learning how to be farmers. And so at the um, Holy Family Mission, which was on uh, Two Medicine River, um, they had what you would consider today a subsistence farm. Um, they grew all their own vegetables, they grew all their own beef, they had their own dairy cows. And so one of the things that the boys were trained to do was to take care of sort of all the outside kind of farming efforts. And inside, the, the girls were taught how to do things like cooking, um, and canning, and especially cooking things that they had absolutely um, no history or knowledge of. So things like bread, which was completely new to the Blackfeet. Dairy cows, they learned how to do things like make butter, which was completely new to the Blackfeet. Um, uh, take care of uh, uh, pasteurizing um, milk, etc. cetera. Um, so there was a huge effort and a lot of time spent on trying to change children over into being um, farmers. And during this time period as well, going back to the Food Sovereignty Project that I talked about earlier, there was a huge effort to change the way that children ate um, so that they are no longer eating uh, native foods and, and native um, uh, plants, 
they are now eating West, um, uh, Western foods completely. So at the same time that is going on with children, there are several different efforts that are happening with adults um, of uh, trying to teach um, adults how to have subsistence gardens um, at their own allotments. So now that people had individually allotted lands, um, an effort to um, teach them. Uh, and so there were um, farmers who, were, who worked for the agency, again, paid for out of Blackfeet monies, um, who went from, um, from community to community and taught um, the Blackfeet how to be um, farmers. Okay, so I'm going to read a little bit more about farming. If I can find. Okay. The U.S. government had initially divided the reservation into four agricultural districts in the late 19th century. However, when Fred Campbell became the new agency superintendent in 1921, he expanded the districts into 29 chapters. He then started the Pagan Farming and Livestock Association and a five-year industrial program in an effort to focus on small-scale market and subsistence-level farming and not the large-scale farming and ranching that had been attempted earlier. The Haskell Indian School National Newspaper, The Indian Leader, reported that the Blackfeet, quote, chapter membership averaged about 15 families, reported that Blackfeet, oh wait, oops, okay, reported that Blackfeet were associated together through relationships or marriages prior to the time of allotments and were allotted in communities according so that the chapter membership in many instances comprised a large family group, unquote. So basically what they're describing is what we would call a, a band. Um, unknown to the Blackfeet agent, Campbell had essentially reauthorized the Blackfeet band system overnight. This, moved, um, this move, to a certain extent, allowed bam, band relationships to remain intact for a while at the beginning of the 20th century, even though many Blackfeet families, especially those living on the south side of the reservation, had continued to live in these communities centered on their old band affiliations. Now they could do it with government sanction. So one of the things that's happening, was happening then, was there, there was an effort to, to disband the bands. And so there was an effort to um, move people around so that they were no longer living in their original sort of um, clan um, villages. And one of the things that um, Campbell did, literally by accident, was he recreated these by dividing up um, the dividing up the reservation into 29 um, in, uh, uh, farming districts. Okay. So this is just to let you know. This is a photo up here of Amesback, who is my grandfather's father, and he was a leader of one of the districts, um, farming districts. So. In one of those odd flukes of historical research, my husband and nephew discovered a file on Amesback in the President's subject files for the Great Northern Railway in Minnesota, at the Minnesota Historical Society in St. Paul, Minnesota. It was serendipitous to say the least, because nowhere in the archival finding aid was there any mention of his name. My husband took our then young nephew, Martin Beck, with him to the Minnesota Historical Society to show him what historians do, right? And to help us conduct research on a book project we were working on. That's when we were working on the Chicago book. And on that day, they found a file on Amesback, my great-grandfather. The thin file held a fascinating array of drawings, letters, doc and documents of that year's final competition between the Bullshoe and Amesback chapters of the Pagan Farming and Livestock Association on the south side of the reservation. Within the file was held a five-page list used to tally the competition points with merits and demerits. 
Building a chicken house, plus 10 points. Owning a chicken, plus 5 points. Owning more than two dogs, minus 10 points. <laughs> the points reflected the new American assimilationist efforts the US government hoped to encourage. Workhorses and family animals, yes. Dogs, no. The file contained detailed information regarding the contest, which took place over the summer and fall growing seasons between the Bullshoe and Amesback chapters. Finding a list of the relative merits and demerits of one's own family, of family's home life was shocking to say the least. There were even points assessed for the quote, general appearance and home, including children. On the one hand, it was historically fascinating to view a file with such rich history and documentation of governmental public policy and process. Historians have long written about allotment, agriculture, forced assimilation, and the acculturation process in tribal communities. I have read, with historical objectivity, many of those works. However, it is another experience altogether to view the story of your own family being judged in such a public way, in a competition that literally graded the contents of one's own family, dirty laundry and all. So I'm gonna end this section here and then I'll show you, I'll, show, I'll actually show you the photos from that, um, from that file. So the purpose of the agricultural program in the 1920s was to develop self-sufficiency and self um, sustaining farms and gardens, growing domesticated American crops. However, a decade after the startup of the Blackfeet Industrial Program, a significant amount of the food preserved by the Blackfeet women continued to come from native plant sources and not from their new American home gardens. The federal government's extension service reported in 1933 that among native fruits and berries canned by Indian women on the on the reservation in the 12th annual midwinter fair were canned choke cherry syrup, huckleberries, strawberries, gooseberries, sarvis berries, bullberries, choke cherry jelly, and among the dried fruit, choke cherries, sarvis berries, dried meat, pemmican. These are all native species, obviously. <laughs> and none came from the introduced American species of the New American Gardens. So this is a photo that is from the industrial survey that happened in 1921, and this is um, my grandfather's parents, um, and it just gives information. So one of the things they did in this industrial survey in 1921 is they went to every single family home and family um, farm at that point, and, and, and just did a, 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 wrote a report about it. They usually took a photo of the family or they took a photo of the family and, and their house. Um, and they basically, um, some of them um, are very um, uh, kind um, and others are, are not so kind um, the way we would view them today. So this is a picture of, um, and my grandfather's mentioned in there a couple of times as, the one, of the one of the two sons. Okay, so this is out of the one file that I mentioned um, that my husband and my nephew found. And so this is a cartoon, there was actually several cartoons drawn about the um, actual competition that occurred between the Amesback chapter and the Bullshoe cap chapter. And the prize for this particular, um, for, for this particular po competition was this prize bull. Um, and the reason why it existed in this particular, um, it, it existed in the Great Northern Railroad um, files was because the Great Northern Railroad provided the prize. And so we were looking for stuff about Chicago and we found this file um, that was completely separate um, about um, this competition. And this is part of the list of what the competition, um, uh, what people were being judged on. And there's a, it goes on, there's, it goes on for several pages and then there's a final page where they tally up all the points um, 
that um, people uh, between these two these two chapters um, of the Pagan Farming and Livestock Association. So as you can see, it includes things like appearance, um, what the home and children look like, um, care of implements, best cow, right? dogs. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things I wanted to mention um, and one of the things that I'm interested in, again, in, in um, researching and writing about is kind of this persistence of religious practice. So Ames Back and his wife hollering in the air, which there was a picture earlier of her, were religious leaders on the Blackfeet, on the south side of the Blackfeet Reservation. So not only was he the leader of, the, um, of his chapter of the farming um, association. He was also the leader um, that was considered a religious leader in the community as well. And one of the things we find, if you look at the list of who, um, who was part of um, the Pagan uh, Farming and Livestock Association, a lot of the leadership of those were either people who had already been political leaders or religious leaders. And they just got re- um, uh, they were recognized in the community already, but then they became recognized um, by the uh, Blackfeet tribe. Okay, so I want to end by saying a little bit more about other things that's go that are going on in this piece. So. This book seeks to explore many different interconnected subjects. Life on the reservation at the turn of the century, the role of outside scholars who recorded information about Blackfeet knowledge, the Blackfeet who told stories to outsiders, the Blackfeet belief system and how it informed their understanding of nature and their resilience despite hardship. The, 18, not, the 1880s to the 19 teens was a complex time for the Blackfeet. The older generation, the ones who reached adulthood before the reservation were struggling with disorientation. They learned that their vast environmental knowledge was of little use within the confines of the reservation and the reservation economy. While this dramatic shift was occurring on the reservation, modern America discovered these old time Indians. They believed that Indians like the bison would soon be gone. Dozens of museum curators, academics, government officials, and amateurs flocked to the Blackfeet Reservation to gather information and collect material culture. With them, a new economy emerged on the reservation. Old timers learned that they could make money selling stories, old songs, and even their old clothing and moccasins. Instead of going bison hunting for a living, now old men told stories about bison hunting. Instead of sewing bison hide teepees, now old women told stories about how to design a bison hide teepee. Selling the nostalgia of the past became a part of their present day lives. The stories they told and sold were not always the types of stories that these early recorders of Blackfeet life were expecting. The stories they told spoke of resilience, strength, and relationships with supernatural. Blackfeet religion provided this older generation with continuity and stability in their chaotic lives. I began this book by recounting my own aha moment when I realized that the old time Indians did not believe that they quote, lived in harmony and balance with nature, the way we often portray them today. Instead, they believed that they could change and control nature. What a powerful worldview, I thought. This book is an effort to tell a part of this story of the Blackfeet religious belief system and their understanding of the natural world. So thank you very much. I think we've got about 10 minutes left for a few comments or questions. So thank you. And you may have to turn the lights on because I can't see anybody.
I can kind of see Mary because she's wearing orange. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, oh, there yeah. we go. I think that one of the reasons that people talk about uh, contemporary Indians as you call it, being in harmony with nature is because they want to contrast that with a Christian white society who believes in the Bible that they should have dominion over nature. So how would you contrast that view with your the view that you just described with the black people being able to control it? So, um, so I would say the difference is that the Blackfeet also believe, um, well, first of all, they believe that they are kind of the lowest of the low in terms of um, entities that live in this world. And so the only way, um, so one of the things I explain in the book um, is that the Blackfeet believe that um, in order to live in this world that you have to have allies um, with the supernatural. And so one of the things the Blackfeet always did was they created allyships um, with not just one, but numerous um, supernatural allies uh, to live in the world that we live in. And so um, when I'm saying that the Blackfeet believed that they could control and change nature, really they couldn't do it. It was something that their supernatural allies did. And it was something that they would ask their ally um, to do on their behalf. Um, so if, for example, they wanted to change the direction of the wind, they're not actually doing that. They're actually asking their supernatural ally to do it on their behalf um, so that they can have a, uh, an easier um, existence. So it's, a, so it's a little bit different in terms of um, that you are uh, controlling it for your own, um, uh, as a hierarchical system. Um, because the Blackfeet always believe that in terms of hierarchy, they're, at the, they're the lowest of the low. <laughs> yeah, humans are, anyway. In, in the, uh, okay, go ahead. I can't see people, but go ahead. In, so in the research I've done, I haven't found that. And I think that, th I think that that doesn't exist at least for the Blackfeet for a couple of reasons. So when people were being interviewed by out outsiders and they were going to share a story, um, there's evidence in a lot of the actual recordings that people would first ask their supernatural ally if they could share the story. So there's almost always evidence of them, what we would call praying, right? So they would, they would talk or communicate to their supernatural ally about sharing a particular story. And the Blackfeet have a real strong belief in exactness. Um, so in doing things um, exactly the same way that it's always been done, to memorize stories exactly as they've always been told, um, to do things in the exact same way that it's always been done in the past. Um, so kind of this idea of exactness and, and sharing um, stories um, then kind of translates into people would not, um, would not want to do something where they would change the story uh, as it has always been shared or passed down. Um, that was just not something they would do because they would for a couple of reasons. One is um, they're sharing a story that is possibly a story related to their supernatural ally. And so because they, are ha they have this relationship with the ally, they would not want to, um, uh, they would not want to uh, in any way harm that relationship that they have, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I don't have evidence in at least the, black, the case of the Blackfeet that people, um, you know, like, changed a story or tried to fool people or um, anything like that um, from, from what I've read. Yeah. There was a question over here. I saw somebody. Yes. Yeah. Um, this goes back to your activism. Um, uh, Roland Wine. Um, you know, and I heard you use that in the Korean 
So, no, I haven't been involved in that. <laughs> so, uh, but, oh, the question was about the Badger 2 medicine and about, um, about, I guess, about tribal organizations that are involved in the Badger 2 medicine. So the tribe itself is involved. Um, and then the, there's some um, international NGOs that are also involved um, in the Badger 2 medicine. And at this point, um, I guess, uh, federal agencies um, are also involved. The Department of Interior has been actively involved in, in um, addressing um, that issue. So, way up there. Read my book. <laughs> And you'll find out. <laughs> I'm serious. So I'll, an I'll answer that question in two ways. So the question was about activism. I'm, I think most may people may have heard you. Um, so I'll answer that question in two ways. One, um, for the historians in the crowd, I think historians are the best activists in the world because we write history. Um, <laughs> and, and to quote um, uh, uh, somebody, uh, Don Fixico, who is a Native American indigenous historian, um, you know, we can make people famous or we can make them infamous. <laughs> and so I think that um, there's great power in the ability to write uh, history and to, uh, of course, get published, <laughs> um, but to, to write books. And I think it's really important for historians to write books and to write articles and um, for us to tell the story um, that we, the interpretation that we think is the proper, maybe not the correct, but the proper interpretation of a particular um, event, place, people, etc. So I think that's one, that's one answer to that. I think the other answer is I also, I personally write a lot of commentaries. So I do a lot of um, where I just write commentaries that are published. I also do a lot of kind of the letter to the editor type commentaries. I think that's another great way in terms of um, activism of letting your voice be heard about particular issues. So I think, me personally, again, because of um, my love of writing, I think that writing is a great place to be an activist um, and not just, you know, kind of um, March for Science standing on the corner with your sign, right? So that, that I, I think that there's two different ways to do that. One is be a good historian and also write commentary. Yeah. So. Yes? <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what they mean, but I can guess. Um, so, I, I mean, it just means, it literally means what that says. Um, when you're no longer, I mean, I think what it means is sort of on, off topic um, is the way it's meant today as a colloquial term. Um, I, it can be, it can be. Um, uh, there's a lot of phrases that, uh, that, that are kind of these racialized phrases um, that can be uh, offensive and, um, and, uh, and are to people. So I think there's time for one more question because it's almost 7 o'clock now. And just to let you know, there's going to be a reception afterwards that I, I'm a, a, I think there's, I'm not sure, is there food involved and drinks? Yeah. <laughs> So I, would, so I would say stay, and if you have questions for me, come up to me personally and, and visit. Um, so anyway, 
Any other questions, comments? Sorry, my next. Amanda. The, so, yeah, so the Bolshu chapter one, and I don't remember off the top of my head the numbers, but it was something like 750 to like 400 points. Yeah, it was, it was, it, it was a pretty much a slam dunk. <laughs> so, okay. Oh, wait, there was one question, oh, one question in the front. Yes. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Go ahead. So I guess my question is: Are you familiar with the, the topic that you were presenting this evening? Are you familiar with what went on in Canada during the same era? And just kind of a compare and contrast sort of question. Yeah. So the question was about the Blackfeet in Canada. So the Blackfeet are split by the Canadian uh, by the U.S. Canadian border. So that right now there are three. Um, Blackfeet reserves in Canada and there's one Blackfeet reservation in the United States and um, so there's a very similar history although different um, up in Canada um, a similar effort at uh, instead of Americanization right Canadianization um, a, se a, se a several you know similar effort at kind of the um, Christianizing and um, what we'd call civilizing um, efforts, uh, a similar effort at, uh, at uh, turning them into farmers and ranchers. Um, they, the difference though I would say during the time period that I'm interested in is they did not have the same level of interest um, in terms of um, museums and academics um, and, and amateurs coming to visit them and record their stories. That happens a little bit later in Canada than it happened in the U.S. Um, why that is, um, I'm not, I mean, I, I can guess. I haven't done enough research to say. But um, the same level of, you know, the museums that came out, they all came to the American side and recorded people and, and, um, cr and gathered material objects um, for the museums in the U.S. That happens a little bit later in Canada. And the same thing with stories. So I was looking at a particular time period for the stories that I was interested in, and um, there's not that many during that same time period in Canada um, as there are in the United States. So that's why I primarily focused um, on the United States. So, so thank you. So I, there's a reception afterwards, so thank you very much. <laughs>